and welcome to series four, episode six of In Suspense, a podcast and vodcast for fans and writers of crime fiction. I am Laura North and my co-host is the lovely Leslie Cara. Hello. Um, in our last episode, we spoke to the very wonderful for Trevor Wood um, about his long road success from the submissions process, which was a really fascinating um, chat with him. And I think certainly one to listen to when you start to feel like it's never going to happen, because I think it just goes to show perseverance is, is so key. Um, and I think we should have him back on the show as well, because I realised afterwards, Leslie, that we didn't get to chat about some of his other careers because he was a spin doctor for the local council. And I just think how amazing that the fiction, the, the practice of fiction must have been brilliant. And, you know, I meant to ask him about that because, you know, I, I sort of I remember I, when I used to work in further education and I wrote um, as I felt like a bit of a spin doctor because I used to write <laughs> the quality report and the self-assessment report. And I remember thinking, this is a this is a work of fiction I shouldn't really admit to that but uh yeah so we yeah it would have been interesting to ask him about that but we should do a show on um fiction when it's not actually fiction and uh, I'm sure there must be loads of careers where people um yeah. are uh, making stuff up I bet I bet god yeah <laughs> Today we have got another phenomenal guest. Um, our topic is So You Want to Write a Police Procedural. The timing couldn't be better because I would quite like to write a police procedural next year. Um, or something. Well, something with just a bit more. I've got this idea for a story, but it has a lot more police in it. So I think it's still going to come from the perspectives of the um character, the victims, if you like, and the characters and not the Please, but I still feel like I, I need more information on police procedurals to be able to write it. I can feel you inching your way towards a series, can't oh, I? I don't know, I don't know about that. <laughs> um, so that's great. And we have got the um, best-selling author, the wonderful Olivia Kiernan, um, joining us shortly to talk to us about police procedurals. But before we dive into the topic, Leslie and I have both been doing NaNoWriMo now for 16 days, as it's now Tuesday that we're recording this on. Um, so how how are you, Leslie? Are you OK? <laughs> <laughs> I'm OK. You saw my some of my little um, sat, pathetic little messages on our on our group. No, I mean, I'm way behind on the word count. I don't think I will make the 50,000. And I was was kind of on the verge of bowing out because it kind of goes against my natural method of writing as you know I'm a very slow sort of um, laborious writer I do a few paragraphs read them back edit as I go and, and I mean I have written four novels that way so there's obviously that method works for me amazing novels that way oh, bless you bless you darling um, but I, so I, I, I was really motivated doing Nano at first and I was, you know, hitting the sort of 1600 words every day and feeling really galvanised. And then it kind of dropped off a bit because I had a busy week and um, completed on the, our house sale in Frinton and then I had my son up for the weekend. So I did fall behind and it's, it's a, once you've slipped behind, it's really difficult to catch up. So I was going to bow out, but now I've decided I won't and that I will just keep going. And I mean, to be honest, although I haven't, I'm not half, you know, I should be at least 25,000 words by now. And I'm only, I think, 16,000 I've done since we started. But that's so much more than I would normally have written in 16 days. It really is. So I think I will just continue and hopefully I will, you know, I will have a reasonable word count at the end of it. And unless, you know, I might even have a, a mad last minute spurt. And, and Yeah. How, how many words had you written before you started? Um, I'd written 20,000. Oh, yeah. Same with me. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, I've got 36,000 now, which is great. And yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and my aim was anyway, without Nano, my aim was to get to about 50,000 words by Christmas. So I'm sure I'll do that. Oh, just, yeah. I'm sure you will. And you're at that really tricky middle bit as well now. So you have to cut yourself a bit of slack for that bit as well. Yeah, it's the worst bit, isn't it? The mm. sort of middle slump that you that everybody tends to hit, don't they? Yes, 100%. Yes. Well, I am, I'm okay with it, but I'm struggling as well. I think I'm struggling with, I think, motivation. I'm really what not wanting to sit in my chair at the moment and I sort of have to really force myself so I'm doing the whole 20 minute timer 500 words and then going off and doing other things I'm, I'm struggling I spent the weekends are really hard really really hard I feel like I was in, I was in debt on Saturday and had to catch up on Sunday um 
but yeah, I'm getting, I'm getting, obviously I, I'm doing okay with my words, but um, you're doing brilliantly with your words. Yeah, though. no, I know, but I'm just saying it's I'm come at such a head. cost, but it's just, it's the cost of dropping things left, right and centre. And, um, and for those who don't know, I um, was at my desk at 10 a.m. yesterday, logging on, wondering where Leslie was, because I'd booked <laughs> the wrong date for the interview with everyone else apart from Leslie. So um, yes, all a bit of a hoo ha for me yesterday, um, and I just I just feel like my whole life is that now. It's just this, everything is just all the balls that I normally juggle are just shattered on the floor, and I'm still trying to write, and it's it's hard. And we're only we're only on day sixteen, so it is it is tough. And I think kudos to anybody who is persevering and keeping going. I think oh, it, it's tougher than you think. It's much tougher than you think. Much much tougher. Yeah. That's, you know, that's a lot of words to to do in one day, and it's not just you know, it's every day, isn't it? And, mm. and I mean, you you're quite motivated by word count and badges, aren't you? You like getting the badges. Love the badges. Just <laughs> buy the badges. I you know I don't give a shit about the badges. <laughs> admit that but I really don't you know I just I, it's funny I bet you were the kind of person Laurie who were uh, did you like getting blue peter badges was that you um no I was never good enough for a blue peter badge <laughs> I just I was never creative enough like with artwork and bits and bobs and uh, yeah I just brownies did you did you used to belong to the brownies? No, I wasn't allowed to join brownies sadly um because I was one of three children and it just wasn't time really to have to do all the clubs and I I, I think I wasn't really a girl's girl. I think my mum probably knew it was yeah. going to be a bit of a waste of time. But um, yes, yeah, so I, I, I didn't do the brownies either. I mean, I did go for two weeks and I just remember sitting on the floor listening to Brown Owl or whatever her name was and thought, this is a load of rubbish. What am I doing here? And, and, yeah. and I'd been nagging my mum to get me the uniform and she said, no, just see how you get on. And she was right because I, I didn't get on at all. But anyway, we've digressed a bit. We have, we have already gone off. <laughs> On off on brownies, but yeah, you like a badge, don't you? I've, Do you? I've, I've noticed that, yes, yeah. I think it's just because we just sat at our desks all the time, and like, I just it's not it's the badge, it's just it's recognition, it's just like a little round of applause from something or someone else that you've achieved something. Because if I say to my husband or the kids, I've done 3,000 words today, they're like, mm, same as yesterday. It oh, means nothing to them. Nothing to them. I'll tell you yeah. what, if you like getting those little notifications saying that you've won a badge, you must never go on to do online gambling, um, Laurie. Oh. <laughs> you're, 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 <laughs> it won't end well. <laughs> Oh, I wouldn't. After I read um, that wonderful book um, by Rachel Edwards, Lucky. 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 Yeah. yeah, God, the fear how quickly things spiral. No, I never would actually. But, um, yeah. Oh, sorry. Uh, so please procedurals. Yes, yes. Mm, right. What do we think about police procedurals? Have you have you ever? I mean, you want to write one, but I would quite like to. I, I really enjoy reading them, and I'm always amazed by the. Um, just the level of detail that goes into them. And I said to one, an author I knew once, I won't name her just in case she doesn't want to be named, but I said, of oh, course, you know, how much research you must have done? And she went, oh, I just watched a few TV shows and oh. made it up. I was like, oh my God, really? Maybe I can do it then. But I, I would feel too worried, I think, because even you can't help there being police involvement in psychological suspense novels. Mm -hmm. And even just when one police officer walks into a scene, I'm, I'm always very conscious of getting their rank correct. Um, yes. I think it's yes. often the case that you always think it's going to be a detective inspector who walks into the room. And it's probably actually going to be a lowly detective constable. And there's yes. just so many different levels. And I, yeah, I worry about it all. But well, um, well like you, I mean, I, I love reading them. And I mm. kind of grew up really reading, um, you know, Ruth Rendell, Inspector Wexford Mysteries. I used to love those. And um, and P.D. James, Dal Dalgleish. I mean, actually, there's a great new crime um, series on TV. I don't know if you've caught it yet, called Dalgleish. And it's based on the P.D. No. Inspector Dalgleish novels with Bertie Cavell or Cavell, Cavell. I'm not quite sure how to pronounce it. Bertie Cavell. The gorgeous Bertie Cavell um, plays the lead part and it's really good it's set I mean because it's set in the 80s um so it you know no mobile phones and things like that it's, it's really really good yeah I'm really enjoying it but I mean as as for writing one yeah I mean gosh I I don't know I, I I'm not sure I I I I like you I get a bit sort of angsty about sort of um having police in and you've got to have them in sometimes and I know that I'm going to probably get it wrong which is uh you know why, why you do have to be careful you have to do your research and speak to the right people don't you 
Yeah, and I think not not fall into any kind of um, cliches as well. I think with the you know the detective who's hitting the booze at the end of the day, you, you just have to be quite careful, don't you? Um, and but and if, even if you just make a, like a tiny slip up, you just know someone's going to email you. So I got a message last week from a, a reader who asked me where I'd done my research from in Safe at Home for. Um, the gymnastics because one of the children was an elite gymnast and she went my experience is that they do far more than the hours you've put in the novel and I just confessed and was like yeah I know but I and I do know completely how many more hours they do probably double what I put in but I had a story I had to write and if she's driving back and forth to gymnastics gymnastics all the time she's not going to be able to solve this mystery (laughs) so I had to cut her um but so I think it's important, isn't it, to get it right? It's important to get it right, but also I don't think you should get too hung up about it because, you know, I mean, I've heard real policemen say that everything they see on the TV, you know, line of duty, all those things, they get so many things wrong and they exaggerate mm. things. And even though they will have police advisors, obviously, on the set, um, things things still slip through and because the reality of policing is very, can be very tedious and, and office yeah. Um and that doesn't, translate to good drama does it or good fiction no I think you do you know there's certain shortcuts and certain things have to be have to be sort of you know allowed really (laughs) absolutely and I I put on Twitter didn't I last week about um who's the guy who's the police advisor because I wanted to name drop him because I've got him in the back of my mind to talk to next year and you, you've worked with him anyway, so it's not for me to name drop. You should name drop him. Yes. The lovely Graham Bartlett. The wonderful Graham Bartlett. He's really good. I mean, he advises a lot of writers, uh, crime writers, on their fiction because he, you know, he's with his wealth of experience and he's sort of set up a, a whole sort of consultancy service now mm. to cover police advisors working uh, um, with authors. And uh, yeah, I worked with him on my next novel that's coming out next year. Um, well, I mean, worked with him. I, we, we had a lovely video session um you know a zoom session where we i just chatted him through i sent him sort of the the bits of the novel i wanted some help on and so had you written them first and then got his help on it yes i had i kind of written the first draft and there were aspects of it so i kind of sent him a synopsis a sort of a, a potted summary of the novel and the bits that i specifically wanted his advice on and um, so, and then I sort of compiled a list of questions because he'll work with you any way you want, really. Yeah. You know, you do a, it could all be done by email if it's just some simple, straightforward questions, or he'll set up a Zoom meeting and he records it so you can play it back and listen to it. And uh, and that's probably easiest because you can have more of an informal uh, discussion. He'll even read. I mean, he didn't do this me, but he'll even read an entire novel, you know, and do a manuscript yeah. critique on all the police procedural aspects and I mean half of what we talked about hasn't ended up in my novel because it's not a police procedural but you know there are just passing references to things crime scenes and things like that and I just wanted to make sure that I'd got those right because you know even though there wasn't much I wanted it to be relatively okay so but if if there are any mistakes in the novel it won't be Graham's fault I can assure you (laughs) it'll be mine for not listening properly (laughs) And I had a quick, a cheeky look at his website as well, which is www.policeadvisor.co.uk. And he does um, like day courses as well. And there's one in March that I want to do, which is all about um, police custody and suspect interviews, which I think sounds really interesting. So I'm going to sign up for that. So, yeah, I think definitely if you're thinking of writing a police procedure or you're in the process of writing one, I think he's probably a, a great go to guy by the sounds of it. So um, and I, I will be in touch next year with him. Definitely. Now that course sounds really interesting. I wonder if there's any places left. I might have to sign up for well, I haven't booked it yet. So if anyone's getting a place, it's me, okay? So don't... Okay, all right. Well, <laughs> I'm being told off. Oh no, Laura's telling oh, me. Always. Someone has to get told off on the show. Um, well, lucky for us anyway, we've got the very talented Olivia Kinnan to talk to us and answer our questions about police procedures, haven't we? Yes, we have. And we can't so, wait to talk to her. Yes. Welcome, Olivia. Welcome. <laughs> Hello, Olivia Kiernan, and welcome to In Suspense. 
Hello, great to be here. We're absolutely delighted to have you on. And uh, first of all, I'm going to read your bio and then we'll then we'll get cracking with the questions. So Olivia Kiernan is an Irish writer. In a previous life, she completed a diploma in anatomy and physiology, then a BSc in chiropractic before she succumbed to the creative itch and embarked on an MA in creative writing. In 2015, she began writing Play Dead For Me, formerly titled Too Close To Breathe, a, um, a crime thriller that was published in 2018 and features Dublin detective Frankie Sheehan. The Killer In Me and If Looks Could Kill followed soon after. And the fourth in the series is The Murder Box, which was published on July 22nd of this year. Now, Olivia, you and I, we first met at an event in Goldsboro Books, didn't we, in London? Yes, yes that was lovely. Uh, I, I was interviewing you and Erin Kelly. I think I had to stand in last minute for Belinda Bauer. And I remember thinking, uh, oh, they must yes. be terribly, terribly disappointed that it's, <laughs> that it's not Belinda. <laughs> I was delighted to meet you. I thought you did a great job moderating. Oh, but it was it was a really nice evening, and um, and you know you, you just I think you just the killer in me had just come out, hadn't it? Then it was it was your second book, and now here you are with with book four under your belt, um, and it's such an amazing, intricate, and original premise. Um, I absolutely loved it. Um, so I was wondering whether you could tell our listeners um, a little bit about The Murder Box for, for the benefit of those who haven't yet read it, obviously without spoilers. <laughs> yeah, so The Murder Box, and I'll just get the, the cover here so you can see it. Just up there. Um, the temptation is always to read from the blurb at the back when people ask you these <laughs> questions so you can remember. Um, but yes, basically my detective, she's working on a, a case on a missing celebrity in Ireland and she's not doing very well. So she's not getting far, very far with this case. So readers who know Frankie will know how frustrating that is for her. Um, and it's coming up to her birthday and she receives a birthday gift. And at first she doesn't think much of it. It's just a murder mystery game. She thinks it's a gag gift from one of her friends. Um, and on one night when she's after work, she's particularly frustrated with this other case. She decides for some light entertainment, she'll have a look through this murder mystery game. And when she opens the box, she sees that it's laid out very authentically. So it has a post-mortem report. It has its own case file. It has small pieces of evidence within the box that you're supposed to use to help solve the mystery, um, which is of a missing um, young woman. And again, she kind of puts together a few clues and it's not until the next day when another woman comes into the office and starts telling her about her missing flatmate that Frankie begins to see some similarities between how she's describing her friend and the mystery box that she's received. So, and the book goes on from there. Yeah. Fantastic. That's very well described. Um, I'm I, the I, ooze, I, but there was no ooze after that. I didn't know if you left it again. Oh, I don't maybe there was no ooze just because we read it and completely agree. Perfect. 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 Um, yeah, I really loved it. And I think if to me it just felt so fresh. I'd been I, re I do enjoy reading police procedurals, but I've, I've been reading quite a lot of psychological suspense, you know, whatever you get through the door. Um, yeah. And I was delighted to receive The Murder Box. And it, it did just have this real fresh feel to it. And um, I just loved all the characters. Um, and I was fascinated by the concept of um, the idea that this box arrived for her. And I wondered if, if those actually exist, like if games like that actually exist. And I, it made me wonder where you got the idea from for, for the story. Yeah, I think the idea came when I was researching um, The Killer in Me, so the sec my second book, which has a kind of true crime element. And when I was looking kind of on people who might follow those type of cases and what type of, because that, that deals with a historical case, a, a, wrong, um, a wrongful conviction kind of thread runs through the story. Um, so I did kind of a lot of research with true crime documentaries and, and podcasts at the time. And so I gradually became aware that there was quite a lot of 
um, popularity for this armchair detective at home solving your own case and and certainly even with a lot of podcasts even from lay persons some of them have actually helped with solving real life cases so it, it kind of in that way I was brought into it and then I did become aware that people could subscribe to murder mystery games that have um quite authentic looking boxes so you're kind of you know you're sent a murder mystery game and you put together the clues and and some of those um games will also have kind of online presence an online presence as well where communities of players can kind of come together and share information or trade information on how to solve them so that was kind of how it was an amalgamation of those two things when i put together the pitch to my publisher and um Initially as well, I thought when I started looking at Dublin, because I really wanted to set this in Dublin city centre, and when you look at the map, it's um, it's very symmetrical, like there's a, the River Liffey runs through the city, and then if you were to fold over the map, you'd almost have the same shape on either side and it kind of just again it's just like adding to that inspiration for the idea you know yourself like you're always you're like a magpie you're kind of looking for elements and then it it almost becomes like the universe is putting them in your path because you begin to see things that can apply to to your book Um, and in this case it was it just reminded me of it of a board game and I thought okay um, I can use that within the book because I do like to have some new little bit of procedure that I bring into each book and in, and in the murder box they use something called geo profiling and um, so it's kind of applicable the shape of Dublin was applicable to the both the board game idea and how Frankie and her team were going to approach solving the case so yeah lots of <laughs> lots of different places it came from but I think that's quite normal for a lot of writers well, that's so fascinating thank yeah. you <laughs> I think I did. I, I read somewhere that you did you host a murder mystery dinner at Harrogate once. Was that was that? Yes. Yeah, so that's another. That ex- yes, yeah, that, that was idea. that was a real jumping off point because I was right in the middle of writing the the killer and me, or I just finished it then because yeah. I, my debut had only been published, I think, three or four months beforehand. And in Harrogate, they do, anyone who's been there is usually familiar with, they have an author dinner where usually they'll have an author, another crime author, author write a script for a murder mystery dinner. And then readers will buy tickets and each of the tables, which are like six or seven um, readers on each of the tables, um, will have a host author that will host that table. And I did feel just so incredibly sorry for my group of crime fans because although I feel like I can craft a mystery, I am the worst person when it comes to solving them because I just overthink them too much because I'm, I'm always just adding just little twists in, in my head and go, no, that's, that, it won't go that way. <laughs> And they were so passionate about this murder mystery game. Like you could feel, I did feel a bit of pressure because I thought, oh God, they, they really want to win here. And and I knew in my heart, I'm going to lead them to failure. That's all I'm thinking. <laughs> I'm only taking them to failure. And of course we did win. <laughs> yeah, so. You haven't been the, invited back then. <laughs> <laughs> not for the author dinner, but you have been lucky enough to go to Harrogate a, couple, a few years. But um, but yeah, that, that again added to it because it was that fever of, of that kind of um people who are, who are kind of really into murder mystery and that need to solve we need to solve the puzzle that kind of attraction and I, and I, it was almost like I wanted to boil down that for the murder box I was going, what the things that attract readers to mystery fiction I, to condense it as much as I could um in in the plot which was great for me because you have a natural a very natural structure then you you know what you're doing so um, so yeah, just as I said, you're pl- you're plucking those ideas from everywhere, aren't you? Yeah. No, yeah. that was that was that was an excellent description of it be how to you know how you were inspired to write it. Fantastic. It must be similar for for you guys, is it? Or when you get an idea, do you kind of? I think pulling... so. And I think what you said about resonances and things you sort of pick up, you're kind of more attuned to things that are relevant to the the novel you're writing, and you're just sort of aware of those things. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's sort of a bit a bit magical, really, isn't it? How that? Yeah, happens. it's a nice part I think of writing yeah. when you yeah. and it kind of it's it's affirming in in a silly way because you know it's not it isn't a kind of mystical or magical thing, but 
it does when an idea when you have an idea or a sense of an idea and then something else comes along that really fits yes. it makes you feel like I'm on the right path even That's though right. it's just yeah. really coincidental you know but it makes you feel like you're it does trick you into thinking that you know what you're doing <laughs> I'm yeah. sure you do <laughs> I don't know about that Laurie <laughs> Now, Olivia, I love reading books set in Ireland, and I've I've recently just finished Catherine Kerwin's latest Cruel Deeds, which was setting is set in Cork, and you, as you said, set your novels in in Dublin, um, but you don't live in in Ireland anymore, do you? I think you live in you live in Oxford now, Oxfordshire, yeah. is it? Yeah. yeah. And uh, so I was really wondering, you know, I mean, obviously the the, the the wonderful weather and the landscape in in Ireland adds to the the, the sort of um, the, the drama and the, the setting as well doesn't it so but I was really wondering what whether you deliberately set out in, in you know before you wrote your debut to set your books in Ireland or whether you know whether that was a conscious decision um, or whether you just found yourself automatically writing about Ireland because it maybe made you feel closer to home I don't know yeah so I've lived um, in the UK since I was 19 um, and and Sometimes I think you have to move away from a country to really know it. And I think there is, I have such huge love for Ireland now, more probably more. And maybe I'm I'm a little rose tinted sometimes when I look back, but I just I, I just love it so much. And in that way, it was a joy and, and it was a conscious decision. I wanted to set it in Ireland because I did want to revisit my, my home place in that way and I, and I love living in Oxford it's not that I don't like living here but um but uh, yeah Ireland obviously has a special place but it, it there's more I think I can I could use the dialogue a little bit more because I am Irish so I enjoyed that aspect as well I've been able to go back to that kind of Irish voice and bring it into fiction um where I could and not all of my books are set in, in, not all the Frankie Sheehan are set strictly in Dublin. Some of them move out, like the third one moves out to Wicklow. So I got to go back this pre-pandemic, obviously, and do a nice little road trip around the mountains of Wicklow, which was just wonderful just for, for a couple of days. Um, so yeah, I mean, it, it was a big draw for me to try and set it there as much as I could, just to kind of use the dialogue. And I listen to Irish radio actually every morning to try and keep... The, <laughs> the language in my head as much as much as I can so kind of the rhythms of how people speak yeah when I'm reading one of your books I actually read it in a I mean my Irish accent's probably hopeless but, but I read it in in what I think is an Irish accent and I think it really oh, adds, to the, yeah, adds to the, the, the drama as I say when I go home most people in Ireland will probably tell me my Irish accent was hopeless at this point of <laughs> <laughs> when I visit my hometown it's like um I was on Irish radio a couple of years ago and um, it was in a kind of booth in, in a hotel and near my hometown actually. And it was it, when I started speaking, one of my sisters was in the kind of audience behind. And when I started speaking, one of, one of them went, well, she doesn't sound very Irish, where is she? <laughs> <laughs> Over here, like it, obviously people can hear it very yeah. clearly, but when, when you go back, it's quite funny. Some people were just like, well, I don't know where your accent's from. <laughs> And, and Irish crime fiction is really popular now, isn't it? I mean, I think do they call it Emerald Noir, don't they? I know you've been on a few yeah. Emerald Noir panels. Yeah. <laughs> I think Laurie and I are trying to sort of get a Suffolk Noir trend going, but uh, I, yeah. it doesn't sound as compelling. It doesn't have the same ring to it, does it? No. Maybe Suffolk Cozies. We could try some Suffolk Cozies. Something, yes. Yeah, yeah. Richard Osman, move over. Lauren and Lauren and Leslie are coming. <laughs> but uh, no, I mean, we, we were wondering whether you, you've been inspired by any particular Irish crime writers, Olivia? Yeah, I love Irish um, crime. Um, obviously, one of my favourites is Tana French. So I just think her her books, um, her, her Murder Squad books in particular, are just spectacular. Um, so, it, it, but strangely, I didn't, like I read some crime before I was published, but I wasn't, it wasn't my kind of, main reading I think I have quite a wide range now obviously I read a lot more as Laurie said you get sent proofs um a lot um and just kind of been interested in the in the the shaping of a crime novel now so I will kind of read more around it in that way but I think prior to publication I mean when I started writing the, my first novel I don't think I was fully aware I was writing a police procedural that's how I kind of 
you know, and I had done an MA in creative writing. It's not, not like that I knew nothing about publishing. <laughs> I did, I did know, I thought I knew quite a bit, but um, I guess I was just approaching that side of thing with genre as a reader first, rather than as a writer. And I think when you're a writer, you're very aware of what boxes books might fit in or where they are in a shelf in Waterstones. And um, so for me, I would just kind of pluck books off the shelf that sounded good or looked good. Um, so in that way, a lot of my kind of crime fiction food has come post publication. Um, and that was, I think when I'd first submitted um, my book, a, a few people said, oh, you know, you should read Tana French. So I started reading her books then and I got absolutely sucked right into the murder the murder squad series which most people if they pick up one will do that will happen to them as well it's absolutely spectacular writer and just a wonderful I don't know her characterization that the voices on the page are just just superb like they they really and they sound very they sound very natural Irish and but not over egged, you know, there's a really lovely rhythm to her books and, and obviously massively compelling storylines as well. So I'd highly recommend them. Excellent. Well, our topic for today is so you want to write a police procedural and we couldn't think of anyone better than you, Olivia. And we'd love to understand a little bit more about how you got into writing them. So you said you hadn't you didn't really set out to do it, but did you? at some point do some research into police procedurals did you go on any courses you mentioned geo profiling a minute ago so how do you keep up to date with everything that's going on as well I'm just really nosy with that kind of thing you know I think most writers are you have to have a, a huge curiosity I think as a writer and that's what compels you through the story isn't it is that you usually have whether it is just an element of character psychology or whether it might be a procedural element. Um, and as I said before, I didn't know I was writing a police procedural. I, like, you know, to me, it was kind of detective fiction, a crime thriller. Um, and it was only when that, when agents started getting interested and they were, they were mentioning on the phone, oh, you've, you've written a, a good police procedural. Um, I was like, oh, that's what that's. <laughs> That's what it is. And okay. <laughs> um, that I be kind of became more aware of that. But I think because my background was in healthcare, I am just naturally very um, interested in science or anything that's kind of, you know, the technical aspects of a procedure, procedural really attract me, you know. So in the first book, it was more about the procedure and how they're going to break it down and how they were going to try and um hunt down a killer who was kind of invisible in some way and the second book um was more to do with kind of past convictions and how they would be able to kind of analyze that and also it had that documentary element so there was a real psychological battle between Frankie trying to analyze what was going on in real world and then in the documentary um and the third one was I can't even remember what that one was about yeah that was more about kind of undercover and and kind of analyzing that side and with this one I kind of landed on geo profiling just by accident when I was I don't know what I was reading something else but I came across it and read where it had been used to um find a an arsonist somewhere I think in Canada I can't remember the exact article but it was just it really captured my imagination where they were looking for this arsonist who was lighting fires early in the morning and they didn't know where where it was happening and um, so they looked at certain elements forensically that was left that was left behind in the area burnt areas and I don't know how exactly they did it, but they put it into their system, which has this geo profiling, and it brings up this map. And there's a hot area, and then obviously a cool area, and they're able to kind of narrow down where that the suspect for this crime is likely to live. And then they can put surveillance on that area, and they they kind of put surveillance on the area, and they discovered one morning the guys watching the particular scene where they imagined the next crime was going to because that's the other thing they can kind of predict where the next crime is going to be um and just behind the school building could see some smoke 
manifesting at behind this building and they went over and it was a, it was a woman who was walking her dog early in the morning every morning and but they had narrowed it they had already narrowed her down to the street where she lived where she was likely to hit next just from the pattern of behavior previously so I've, I've found that just really interesting you know and yeah. I just think I just think as well we all think we're so so different but actually <laughs> you know how our behaviors can be studied by these experts who know what they're doing and they're able to predict where next movements are um, so I liked that, you know, I liked that I could use that Frankie might approach a certain crime in the murder box and think, well, this person, and it might seem quite logical when you lay it out, but it, it, she was like, this person most likely will have a car, they will have this. So, but you can see how slowly the case goes from it being a huge number of people who could likely commit this crime, you know, when she's able to say they're likely not working, or if they do, they're working a late night, or they probably don't have a family because they're able to there the crimes are committed at all times and so it's that I found massively interesting and maybe, maybe other people won't but I I'm just fascinated at how um detectives and the police force can kind of narrow things down to just a handful of suspects and how and same with a lot of my books as some of them use cell site and cell site analysis which is your kind of telephone um surveillance um or, or kind of tracing of where someone's hitting mass and how they can use that as well to help kind of narrow down their field of suspects as much as possible. Yeah. And with, I do do a research, a lot of research on reading on, I used to say I didn't before because it never felt like research. It was just stuff that I would kind of gather that I was interested in. Um, and then if I have any kind of um, questions afterwards, there are some people I can contact <laughs> to ask if this is possible or not um but really all all I do look for is is it is it just even a tiny bit possible that this can happen and if it is then I will bring the plot through that but um so to that way I do um quite a bit of research but yeah it's not something I've necessarily studied I did go to a, a police training course for the the killer and me on um domestic violence and how police were and that was run by um really great um woman who champions a lot um for for um survivors of domestic violence and coercive control Laura, Laura Richards so um and that was very interesting as well and that helped quite a lot um but yeah never feels like research so <laughs> yeah no but it sounds like a lot of research but as you say you're not you're, you're just doing it because you're you're interested in it mm. and you're you know yeah. picking up these things and yeah no it's that's but that's that sounds fascinating really really in interesting answer I suppose my next question really you you know you've kind of touched on some of it I mean, what do you think makes a good police procedural novel it's quite a hard question to answer <laughs> I guess but uh yeah, I, th I think it's probably the same as most novels. It's just, you know, you read for an emotional um, engagement. So I think you, you have to have that. So you can't just, I think you need to have that emotional thread running through, through the story. Your detective or your team of detectives, there, there needs to be something in there that kind of um not not just the drama of say the plot or the inciting event and I like to overlap those so I like to have kind of whatever is is going on in Frankie's life at some point will echo the, the crime not not necessarily to the same level but you know there'll be something within the the mystery itself that will bring out a part of her character and I think really the biggest thing with police procedurals the biggest draw for readers of police procedurals particularly series is your character so you you have to have a like most readers if you ask them they don't name the author sometimes they don't name they can't remember the title of the book but they will say the latest i don't know rebus or the late you know they're, they're referring to the character all the time and um, so i think that's probably the most important element of the story is to have an engaging character a good kind of strong um, character voice and um emotion pack your story with emotion if you can yeah and are there any, do you think there are any big sort of no-nos that sort of potential writers of police procedurals should bear in mind when they when they embark on, on trying to write one? 
anything they should avoid? Yeah, I think, um, <clears throat> yeah, I, I think it's really a matter of taste. I think some police procedurals, they, they're they more on the crime heavy and some are, are more kind of the domestic side of the, of the detective. And it really is just down to what the writer wants to write. So I don't think there's no no's in that way. Um, preferably, I think maybe remember that less is more when you're describing anything to do with I don't know, crime scenes or, or blood in that respect. So just kind of have it, have a, um, it doesn't mean you can't go there because, you know, sometimes I think if you're illustrating something, there's a level that you, you don't want to be dismissive of, of a crime. So you want to kind of make sure that it's engaged with in some way. Um, so you don't want to be make it too light in that way but at the same time you don't I think what do they call it that kind of um gratuitous, gratuitous the word. Yeah. Okay, you don't want it to be gratuitous violence for the sake of it I mean it, that's no most readers are, are are too sophisticated for that nowadays you know they demand a, a lot more so I think less is more when it comes to that kind of thing if possible um but otherwise uh, whatever kind of shape your procedural that there's lots there's a sh shape that can you know even cozy crime and stuff like that you know that's all kind of a form of police procedural so it can really you've got a huge spectrum to work on and it's whatever attracts you as a writer I think to always pick what drives you or what's most passionate and that will get you through through your novel Amazing. Uh, so you just touched on this about the um, sort of the life of the detective and how important it is. Um, is there a balance then? How do you get the balance in having their story and the crime like running side by side, if you like, because you don't want to put them, you need them to be involved in the crime to make it more exciting, but you can't throw them so far in that they're not going to be able to write, be in the next story, I suppose. How do you strike that balance? And do you mean, um, so the detective kind of survives for the next Yes, book, exactly, or? yeah. Oh, and, suppose, and isn't so emotionally traumatised that they can't go back to work, I suppose. I know. I mean, I think with Frankie, she's so... Um, in that way, the character of created of a kind of fortunate not for her but for me that in that way that she just keeps getting up and it's just and I think most most detectives in crime series that's they have that kind of um grit in them that they just kind of they can't help it they just can't help going back to the crime but um with regards to kind of the emotional balance I think you mentioned that at the beginning mm. with, the, with the character and and how you kind of manage that between the procedure I think that is difficult I mean but that, that again that's in all genres so you're it's not just unique if you were to remove the police procedural element you're always kind of toggling the emotional reaction of the character and the conflict within the plot all the time um, and within other characters. And that's exactly the same with a murder mystery or with mystery fiction in that you want to, and, and it's the difficult part, isn't it? Because it's the part as well that you, you really have to kind of immerse yourself in your character's mind. And Frankie is just, I'm not like Frankie at all. So it's like, I really have to think, right, what would she do in this situation with her life experience? And as you say, what's just happened in the last few books? And and I do, and usually it's, it's actually, it's a good question because usually now that I realize it, there are the times where I might echo back in the series and, and actually structurally. Um, so obviously that was, completely conscious thing that I do I seen as I've just realized it but I think it is it is something it is yeah usually I find myself that if there is an echo with how a scene is affecting her in the current book with a past book that's where I'll put a tiny little line in so for readers who've read the whole series it's satisfying because they're like oh I know what that refers to but it's not so over egged that um you know you're not putting in an entire paragraph of what happened in the last plot or trying to condense it down or summarize it you're just putting in a little echo so that you it's satisfying for series readers but not off-putting for anyone who is just reading that particular book out of sequence um so yeah those kind of um navigating that is difficult and it is a challenging but it's also the rewarding part of 
of writing in any novel, not just with police procedurals. Mm-hmm. Um, and for a series, <clears throat> it can be that it is hard to sit down and you have to I have to really actively think what emotional journey Frankie is going on for this book. Like I, I have to sit down and think it can't be the same. <laughs> You yeah, have a that's that's like that. stuff that's happened to her in the past, so you can remember like certain things from her character for each book. Um, I try. I mean, I think the emotional arc is usually quite thematic. So I'll go right this like with with the murder box. She's dealing with time and everything falling away. So it's like there's obviously a clock coming with the game. So that's running through the story. Things are running out of time with her first case. Um, and then her partner is beginning to pull away. And there's this whole sense of things shifting. I, like, even if the reader doesn't get this, this is my mind frame going into that novel is, and I'll usually have that written on the wall. This is what she's battling so that I can make sure that those, um, that the stages of that development are, are kind of being hit as the actual mechanics of the plot go forward. Um, So she is dealing with time and kind of things falling away and kind of her lack of control throughout the murder box. So I can't even remember what the first question was. I just went rambling on there. (laughs) But yeah, so that's that's kind of how I work. And I don't plan massively, so I don't do huge, as you say, that's what it was, spreadsheets. Um, But I do love structure. So when I'm finished my first draft, I really love the editing process. So that's when I will go. But I always think I I do the planning in reverse. So I may not plan massively before the novel starts, but it all it it kind of really it all comes out the same in the wash. You know, at at the end of the day, I'm still doing the same thing. I'll just go back and make sure that. Um, all the elements of the plot are there and that the emotional beats are coming in at the right time within the plot too. And I, and I love that part of, of writing. I really like it. Um, and I have a little character Bible where I'll remember, th- if I mention, say, a character's past school, it's that kind of thing. And when you're writing a series where you're like, oh, I know I mentioned that in a, in a book previous. And if you haven't written it down, you mightn't even know which book because it because it, something like that, is their past so you'll only usually be mentioning it really fleetingly so to try and find that is is difficult but now that we have kindle and that it's not so hard because you can just put it into the search bar you know so you can find it it's amazing because i have enough trouble trying to remember what i've said at the start of the book just when i'm writing towards the end i'm like i'm sure i've mentioned the name of the cat somewhere but i don't know what it is um so it's really impressive that you you do that um and i believe you've now sold the tv rights to the series as well with frankie in it um and that victoria schmerfit is going to be playing the part of frankie is that right yeah no it's very exciting so um you know because i was on fourth book in and so you kind of think oh maybe the the tv rights won't go but um, no, she's very excited about the project. and But you know, with TV options, when they happen, it's just an option with the production company taken on, then they kind of put together their pitch and then they will go out and see if they can attract a network to it. So th- at the moment, there's no guarantee it'll make that final leap, but um, <clears throat> fingers crossed. Very exciting. And I, I really like Victoria Smurf. She was in Bally Kiss Angel, wasn't she? I no, love She's brilliant. Her. And she's just so... <laughs> I don't know when she reached out when she contacted me I was like oh my god you'd just be the perfect Frankie you know she she has that kind of vibe about her I think you know she's got that that vul- she's got that toughness but there's a vulnerable center to her yeah yeah she'll, she'll exactly do, that, that kind of Frankie. fragility that um I think because Frankie is so often she drives forward so hard all the time that mm. There, there is this kind of sense of, oh, the crash is coming. You know, you can, there is a fragility to that, I think, within her character. And I think with uh, Victoria Smurfit, as you say, she, she, she just seems to have that, definitely. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yes. I used to love Sunday nights and watching Bally yeah. Angel. <laughs> right. Um, now, do you read a lot of, poli- well, you kind of said you did because you get sent them. Do you read a lot of police procedurals um now and we always like to ask our guests what they're reading or what they've just read whether they've got any recommendations have you got anything you'd like to share with our readers? well I think the last <laughs> I read was um Jigsaw Man I think Nidhi, Nidhi oh was, yes yeah we really liked that as well yeah. and um so I really liked that um 
And I think Jane Casey is also with her Maeve Kerrigan series is really set that set in Ireland. So that's excellent too. Um, and I've just finished actually psychological thriller, um, Joe Jacobman's um, What His Wife Knew. So, and that was really great. Next up is Hidden Bodies with Araminta Hall. So I'm very look, much looking for that, yeah. forward to that because it sounds like it's, um, it's set in Titanic, is it? I don't know if any of you have read it yet or not. No, but... I've not read it yet. No, it sounds I'm amazing. I did about that. So that's the next one up. But um, yeah. Fantastic. What about you, Laurie? Have you had any time for reading with your Nano Rhyme? Um, not, not Work much time. And you're doing, you're doing it as well, aren't you, um, yes. Nano Olivia? How I'm are you not writing you? quite as much as you? <laughs> oh, Olivia, Olivia's you know. doing it as well. Sorry, yeah, that's what I, I am. Yeah, yeah, I'm doing National. It's weird because I, I, my very first book was written in National Novel Writing Month, so they oh. dead for me. So, or, or, or too close to breathe, as it was called. Um, that that was a Nano Rhyme book, um, and that was before I was published. So. Um, so it's been quite a few years since I've completed it because every year I've wanted to do it but I, you know how publishing schedules yeah. work. <laughs> normally I'm already in the editing process by now with the publishing but because the pandemic and the murder box was kind of shifted back a little bit I'm actually in the drafting phase now so I kind of got to I was halfway through this book so I wasn't kind of starting from word zero um but I'm still going for the 50,000 of the, um, the 50,000 word count um, to get me to the end. So I, I got my 25K badge the other day. Oh, you two. <laughs> you two are showing me up now. I've only got 16,000 words. We love the badges. You are. Yes, yeah. It's all badges. about the badges. <laughs> I was really upset, actually, because I'm such a nerd. I went because when I logged on this year, I was really upset that they'd gotten rid of their word widget. That was the kind of line graph. Mm. Do you remember when you typed in when I did it, you had to every time you hit a word count, you got a little column and it would hit this line to show and it was just very satisfying <laughs> yeah they have that on um oh that's the piece of software i use um about novel writing that i use if i'm not doing nano i, I love the graph as it goes yeah up. i was like oh why have they got rid of that word cut which uh, i just don't want i don't want to just have a little kind of yeah it's bar going there, is, there is a little if you go into the stats there is a little yeah. um oh is there oh yes if you if you click on to um my nano rhymo and then um, there's profile group stats well oh, have a look Ooh, have yeah, a little look after this your estimate yeah. how much you work right per hour and all, th all those things yes so oh my gosh oh i'm so going to the graph is still there <laughs> i like the graph but Laurie, you weren't, you haven't told us yet what you... Yeah, sorry, to answer your question, I have just, just finished last night Reputation oh, by Sarah Vaughan, which I absolutely loved. Um, it really is a story of two halves. And um, yeah, that second half, I just devoured it. So a really, really fantastic read. Very yeah, poignant. I'm that. That's a brilliant, really great thriller. Yeah, readers are in for a treat next year. And that comes Yes, out. they certainly are. What about you, Leslie? Um, well, I'm just reading Find Her First, which we've mentioned before, Emma Christie's Emma second novel, yep. which um, I, I should have got you know got round to much early, much sooner but I've been busy but I've finally got into it and I'm loving it I mean she's such a good writer mm. and I was just thinking how how beautifully written it is and how yeah. original it is I was thinking she was all she reminds me of like a cross between Belinda Bauer and Rachel Joyce I know Rachel Joyce isn't a crime writer but some of the ways that Emma describes things are so beautiful that it reminded me of Rachel Joyce so yeah I'm really That's really lovely descriptions enjoying there. Emma Christie's yeah. latest so yeah but, and um, now we're on to our fun question, which is um, we had a bit of trouble coming up with a fun question for this one. So, um, so obviously the murder box um, focuses on game, and we wanted to ask um, sort of if you enjoy playing games, if you've got a funny game story, or are you one of those people that gets quite competitive when you're playing board games, or are you are you not a board gamer? How how do you fit in the in the game zone? Well, not so much a board gamer now, but when I was when I was a kid, definitely. So I had um Cluedo I mean I think we just used up the pads within a, a few I think you used to have little paper pads and you yeah. in the questions and um loved that and we also used to play this game which I think um I did do a bit of research on this when I was um writing the murder box because I, I wanted to kind of remember what it was exactly how it was that we played it it used to be a parlor game I think it was called murder in the dark oh, I don't yeah. know if anyone knows that or not but 
this was how we spent our Saturday nights <laughs> before iPhones. <laughs> um, so, um, yeah, we would, I think that's, I think how it goes is, I remember we had a deck of cards and then you, you'd you pull one out and whoever had it would be the merger and then the detective would go out of the room and the lights would go off and someone would get a tap on the shoulder or whatever, they would scream and then everyone had to freeze. And the only person who was allowed to lie was the murderer. So everyone else had to say exactly the truth if the detective asked the question. But the detective obviously wouldn't know who, which one was who was lying and who wasn't. Um, yeah, I, when I looked back, I was going, I'm sure there must be more to that game because it doesn't sound very interesting. Yeah, I've forgotten all about that, but that was I've forgotten all about it. We I loved, loved it. it. I'm going, why did we love that so much? You know, because I remember just going... I remember thinking when you go in, if you're the detective, well, like, I mean, all you'd ask your friend is, and where were you standing when you heard the scream? <laughs> <laughs> they would just say, I'm standing by the window. And you wouldn't know if they were like, I was like, how, first of all, how on earth did we solve it? And second of all, why did we find that so fascinating? <laughs> but we didn't get enough of this game. We used to play it all the time, but. Um, times, times were different then. I Less know, very simple. <laughs> I should have been wearing a little bonnet or something playing it you know? it's like it doesn't seem like it's that long ago <laughs> but yeah I don't think we catch kids playing it nowadays <laughs> what about you Leslie what's your um what's your take on board games well you know I don't play them so much now but I sort of was really into them as a sort of teenager and in my 20s and 30s we sort of we always used to have you know things like Pictionary and Trivial Pursuit and um and and it would be sort of you'd have friends around for supper or and um, or dinner party god i hate dinner parties I don't know why we used to do all those sorts of things but anyway dinner parties and you know when you've had a few drinks and then the board games came out and any sort of I, i'm very competitive and uh, my ex-husband was very competitive as well and you know if there's any simmering sort of tensions in your relationship that can come out in board games can't they and um you don't want to be playing murder in the dark oh you really don't <laughs> And I remember one evening we had a, another couple of, you know, friends round, another couple, and um, things got so bad between those two that the woman ended up in, locked herself in our bathroom weeping. I over oh, no. Henry, and I thought, oh God, you know, but so yeah, don't tend to pay, play uh, board games so much now. Although we did play it recently. My um, niece and nephew introduced us to a game called Crimes Against Humanity, which was most oh, peculiar. Yeah. I don't really? know if you've ever oh you need yeah, to look that up it's pretty that. horrible and awkward oh <laughs> but, no but um <laughs> funny yeah, yeah. yeah. I, i'm not gonna say any more about oh, it gonna look that i'm up. gonna have to look it up yes it's it's it. <laughs> yeah. we do we do it normally have a um a christmas day board game at some mm. point just you know so that if there has been no fighting by four o'clock we can guarantee some. <laughs> I'm later in the in the afternoon so um yeah so we try so I wish I'll look that one up Leslie thank yes, you yes mm. but I, the recommendation did not come from me I'm just yeah I'll pass me on, pass me on yeah <laughs> Laurie, what about you? What's your um, Well, I, I, I'm no secret to the fact that I'm a massive board game player and, and we get a new board game. The elves bring us one every Christmas Eve. Um, so it's a, it's a long year of research for me um, to make sure the elves get the right one. Um, and we just got one actually last year called Baker Street, which um, I just reminded me so much a bit, not quite in the same level of the murder box, but you do get, um, it's a like Cluedo, but you all are going around trying to solve these clues to who did it. So it's, um, it's wow. a really good one. I'm definitely looking that one up then too yeah that, that's actually a really good it's good and you can do it as a team as well as you don't have to be against each other um because okay. they're very cryptic I would say I don't I sometimes think I'm going to make my own one of this um but I do remember a time I was playing Cluedo with my then my what he is my husband now but was just a boyfriend at the time and his mum and I was always really trying to impress her but my competitiveness got the better of me we were playing Cluedo and you know what it's like when you you know lots of people have got it and you're racing to get there to say who it was and so I, I got there first I was like it's Mrs White with the dagger in the pilot. and I was so excited to have won that I I didn't even look properly and I said completely the wrong thing and I lost the game I was devastated because I had and I had it right as well so oh. I don't I think I necessarily did myself any favours as a potential daughter-in-law that day but um that is generally what happens with me in competitive games. That's funny. 
Well, sadly, Olivia, that's all we've got time for today, but we've had such a lovely time talking to you and thank you so much for sharing all your stories and your wisdom. Some of the things you were yeah. saying about plotting and, and character and everything were really, really interesting. And I'm, I'm really looking forward to playing this back again and, and hearing it all over again. It was great. Bless you. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much. Real detail went into that. And it was um, yeah, really eye-opening to see sort of the different, the different ways to come at a police procedural. So I'll be making notes myself as well. Thank you. Um, on our next show, we're chatting to best-selling author Sophie Hannah on um, writing novels and her dream author coaching as well, which is very popular. Um, but that's that's it for today. I think really isn't it? looking forward to that as well. Yes. And uh, yeah, so that's uh, so it's now it's goodbye from Olivia, and it's goodbye from me, and it's goodbye from them. <laughs> <laughs>